Have you ever had words with someone? Never? What does that what does that even mean to have words with someone? Well, literally, you know, to have words with someone, I mean, that happens every day, right? We share words with one another. Some of us words with friends, probably more often than we should be playing that game. Words to, sh- to have words with someone. What does that mean? What's the connotation? Hmm? A fight, a conflict, a conflict of interest. Now, when you have words with someone, what's the hope? What's the hope when you have words with someone? To settle it to settle the conflict and come to some form of reconciliation with the person. You share your perspective, these are my words, and I hear your words, and God willing, those words come together, and then there's a form of reconciliation at the end. That's the greatest outcome. Where it doesn't work is when you go into that conflict in your mind with your words, And I'm right and you're wrong, and that settles it, right? It will never work when we have that disposition, right? Now, when we consider what occurs in the scriptures today, we see the Spirit at work, especially in the first reading for the Acts of the Apostles. This is what preceded the first council in the church, first century, the Council of Jerusalem. Now, from this council... Throughout all of the years of the church, there have been many councils, right? And it's important that people would get together to share concerns and conflict so that the outcome of a conciliar gathering, council, there would be a sense of unity, greater solidarity, a greater group of congregation that's moving together according to the word of God. How many of you were alive during Vatican II? Raise your hand. Wow, you guys are really old. No, I mean, you guys are like, God bless. That's incredible. No, that's that's a gift, right? That's a gift that you actually saw and experienced firsthand Vatican II. But even in our own time, the synod on synodality, this this importance of being a church that is open to having conversation and sharing words that would produce a greater unity. Now, it's very evident that the Jews were in conflict with all of these Gentiles and people from all of these nations joining, you know, the faith. How are they going to be children of Israel? How are they going to be children of God? Well, shouldn't they abide by the same laws, by the same dietary principles? Shouldn't they be circumcised? Well, Paul and Barnabas representing the forefront of evangelization, they're trying to bring a form of reconciliation, and they did. The Spirit brought about a fruitfulness to this council. What does this have to say to us? Well, my brothers and sisters, we need to be conciliar in our approach. We need to seek counsel. We need to be open with one another. Because each of us are imperfect. We have rough edges. And some of us have very loud words in our head. And those words sometimes lash out at the other. Hmm? You know, nothing will be settled and brought together in unison if that's the way that we approach each other in relationship. You know... We have St. Rita, the first class relic. Today is her feast day, May 22nd. You know, she had a very, very difficult marriage. Some people would say an impossible marriage. She had a husband whose words in his head, they were the only words that mattered. He He had bouts of rage, of anger, of alcoholism, he was carousing around 
being unfaithful. And you know what? St. Rita never gave up. She ever counseled her husband, praying with charity, loving him, and guiding him to the point where his heart transformed and he was not governed by his rage and his anger. What a success story. How in the world did Rita do that? How did St. Rita manage all of this, you know, conflict? Well, she's a saint. So one thing is for sure, Jesus helped her, right? And how did Jesus help her? By the gift of the Spirit. All throughout the scriptures today, we have the Holy Spirit, the advocate that's guiding us to reconciliation and giving us a home. In the book of Revelation, the Spirit took John and gave him an encounter of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. My brothers and sisters, you have a place in the new Jerusalem. You have a position in the new Jerusalem. But it is only the saints that make up the walls of the New Jerusalem. Each of us are called to be saints. Each of us are called to holiness. And the only route that we can go to make it to that place, to the New Jerusalem, is a route in reconciliation. To be men and women who seek every occasion to draw back into one community in Christ, one flock, one faith. As we open up the scriptures today, we hear in the Gospel of John, whoever loves me will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. What is God's desire? That he would dwell with us. That God would de- dwell in this world, in this broken world, in this divided world, in this polarized world, that he would dwell with us. Is that not marvelous to consider? That God wishes to be in your heart and make that dwelling within you. That's God's love. And my brothers and sisters, you are loved. Each and every one of you. God bless you. When we consider the importance of staying in God's word and keeping his word, how do we do that? I'd like to ask you a question. Do you read your Bible every day? Do you open up the scriptures every day? Now, I don't want you to squirm in your seat. I'm just your pastor, and I love you. And there's a lot of things that get in the way from us opening up the Bible every day. A lot. There's so many distractions. But if we are called to keep God's word, we can't just listen to it. we got to meditate on it. What is God saying to me? As faithful men and women, we believe in God. We profess it every week. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. But... I think we evade opportunities to opening ourselves up to God and the Holy Spirit because it's like, what if God doesn't speak to me? What if I don't understand what the Bible is saying? My brothers and sisters, we live in a privileged time in the world. And I don't care what news agency or what group of people say that it's terrible to live in this world right now. What a horrible place to bring children into this world. That's a terrible perspective. We live in a beautiful world. Why? Because we have the opportunity today to reconcile the differences and what's polarizing people. We have the power because God is entrusting us with his love and the spirit today to respond accordingly 
and to have the opportunity of exchanging love with one another. Rita never missed out on an opportunity to express love. And the reason why is because she was so immersed in the power of the Holy Spirit and the sevenfold gifts of the Spirit. Do you remember the seven gifts of the Spirit? We just had 109 confirmandi down at the cathedral. It was incredible. The church was packed. The seven gifts of the Spirit, what are they? Okay, so you're not, you're not, you're not reading the Bible and you're not, you're not following the catechism. <laughs> My good Catholics, I love you guys. I love you guys. Here we go, all right? The, f- the four, four, first four, deal with the intellect, deal with the mind. The remaining three deal with the heart, okay? Knowledge, say that with me. Wisdom, Wisdom. Understanding. understanding, counsel. counsel. These four deal with the intellect. Knowledge, wisdom, understanding, counsel. Now God's word is being shared with you and proclaimed solemnly in the church. This is being done all over the world at this very moment. And it's even being done online right now in all of these different churches. People are being exposed to the proclaimed word of God. Now, how in the world does it turn to knowledge? How does it turn to wisdom, understanding, and counsel in the way that now my life is going to be directed according to the word. Now I'm going to choose and elect from this knowledge that I've received, from these intellectual gifts. How am I going to employ them? It has to be done in the spirit. It has to. So we as a congregation have to say, come Holy Spirit. Say that with me. Come Holy Spirit. Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, and influence me so deeply that my heart, my heart will receive your gifts, and then I can go out and participate in the transformation of the world. Go out into a broken world, into the chaos of today. Not to be measured against the chaos of yesterday, not to be measured in the chaos of Whatever's going to happen in 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, or the next council, today, how do we go out? Well, God gives us the ability to go out into that crazy world with three gifts for the heart. We've already got the gifts of the mind, right? What are they? Now the gifts of the heart, fortitude. The gift of the heart that the Spirit gives is a sense of fortification and protection, strengthening us in confidence that we can go out with our heart and exchange love with another person, unafraid because we pour out love into a broken world in the name of Christ. And we open ourselves. Isn't that what he did on the cross? We are fortified for this work of reconciliation. So we go out in that spirit and in that heart. Second gift for the heart, piety. Piety, a sense of a disposition before God, being reverent for his gifts, being receptive. To be receptive is to be pious and to be upheld each day in your discipline, to live out righteousness. Second gift of the heart. And finally, what's that last gift? Fear of the Lord. Excellent. Fear of the Lord that should be merged with wonder and awe. Right. So it's not a trembling fear. It's a fear of God's magnanimity. It's a perfect word. The greatness, magna, anima, soul, 
There is no greater power and soul and spirit, anima, than God. And we tremble before that power. And we are entering into wonder and awe that this power wants to commune and dwell with us. Does that not get you excited? You know, it gets me excited. God wants to dwell with you. He wants to dwell in your heart. And he wants to give you sevenfold gifts to go out and do something great with your life. Not to be constricted and enslaved to depression and I can't do anything in this world and to be downhearted and be down on yourself. Oh, I can't do that. I, can't, I won't be able to accomplish. I can't transform the world. Yes, you can. By the transformation of your mind, St. Paul says, you can transform the world. One of you. But could you imagine a congregation? Could you imagine a world that is listening to the gospel today respond with God dwelling in their heart? This is why life is beautiful. And you have to see it. You have to believe it. And you've got to participate in it. This is our time. And this is the world that we have inherited. And that should give us great hope, great courage, because we are fortified by God to do this work. My friends, how do we begin the work of reconciliation? By keeping God's word. And if God is instructing us to keep his word, we should also keep one another's words, right? If we could discipline ourselves with that virtue of actively listening to one another, you know, when we share words, when do words start growing in volume? When we're <laughs> exchanging words. When someone is not listening to the words and they're not understanding, right? So it starts out with like, honey, could you take out the trash? Stop you. Hmm? Honey, will you take out the trash? Honey! the trash. Three times you're out. Take out the trash. Right? We grow in anchor and disunity when we aren't listening to one another. You know, I remember being in the seminary. George, you're going to be getting this. So, you know, and, and this just to give you a little context. I had a girlfriend from the time I was in kindergarten, <laughs> Valerie, right? Every year I had a girlfriend. I had to have a girlfriend. My whole identity, my whole life, my whole manhood, masculinity, it depended. It depended on it, right, I mean, I mean it, I depended on it. And it didn't come to like the point when I was 20 and where God's love manifested in the power of the spirit where I realized the power of his love that I realized that my heart has finally found its identity. Like I realize who I am in the eyes of God. After that, it was like, Psh. I could see celibacy. Huh? I could see it. I could understand it. So all the way through the seminary to our last years, we started receiving these counseling classes that we could take out into the world and help counsel others. And I'll never forget getting into the active listening sessions where it's like all you do is you sit down and you say, Joe, how you doing? Great. Great. You're great. Yeah. Actually, I feel pretty crappy. So what's going on that's... that's Feeling, you're feeling crappy. Uh, work. Work. Watch this. <sighs> work. Yeah. Right? Now he's, yeah. 
Now he's conceiving work. Now he's going to share a little bit more. Now this active listening, you know, as we employ it in counsel and ministry, I'm sitting there thinking back from Valerie all the way up to the recent girlfriend that I had going into the seminary. And I'm like, oh my gosh, if I would have had this in all of my relationships, they all wouldn't have failed. Every single one of my relationships have failed. That's why I'm a priest now. You know? <laughs> so you think about it, like the active listening, active listening. It, wouldn't it be amazing that your spouse understood your position perfectly well? <laughs> right? You got to work on it. And the only way to work on it is to be receptive. Receptive. I love being in like a triangular counseling situation with couples because it's like, I'm just sitting there, you know, active listening, words, of, and I'll say, stop, don't say anything, don't say anything, just listen. We whiteboard it out, you go through both sides, and then it's like, you come, it's like, huh, okay, I see where you're coming from. Oh, this is great. I love you. <laughs> you know, I love you. And it's like, that's all we need. Reconciliation, my brothers and sisters, could happen right now. For each and every one of us. But that's why we got to listen. And we got to keep each other's words. If we keep each other's words and we learn how Jesus is saying, keep my word, there is nothing that your relationships will endure that God cannot heal and reconcile. Nothing is impossible for God. Nothing. And I don't care how broken the world is or how broken your relationships are. Do not give up on God. God is faithful and he will manifest his power and in the spirit of his sevenfold gifts will repair something that you think is completely broken, no matter what relationship it is. But we have to have the courage to open up our heart and communicate and listen. So, you've been listening to me for a while now. Hmm? You've heard the proclamation of this good news. You have heard that God wants to make his dwelling with you deep in your hearts. You have heard that he wants to give you abundant gifts. Do you believe it? then profess it. Yes. 